thank you all for joining me. My name is uh, Joseph Butner. I'm a biomedical engineer at a Houston Methodist in uh, Houston, Texas, USA. And uh, today I'm going to talk to you about how we're using uh, mathematics and uh, Mathematica to uh, predict uh, patient response to immunotherapy. Uh, immunotherapy is the hot new thing in cancer treatment. Uh, it's all over uh, TV commercials and uh, even a Nobel Prize here in the last couple of years. But uh, it shows some major shortcomings, uh, primarily in the fact that really it doesn't work for most people. It only works for a small subset of cancer types. And even within those cancer types, it doesn't work for uh, the majority of people. Uh, as you can see from this graphic here from a, a case study a couple of years back, they found that really only about 12 and a quarter percent of uh, people were projected to uh, have a therapeutic benefit. And so uh, a major uh, question clinicians have is why? And so um, we decided that we would study a particular kind of immunotherapy called the checkpoint inhibitor immunotherapy. And basically what this is, is you have immune cells and there has to be a molecular mechanism for your immune cells to recognize your own body's cell. And there is, and when your immune cells look at your own body, they, there's some uh, uh, molecular signaling that happens that allow them to recognize, oh, I'm supposed to be here, don't attack me. And the problem is that cancer, because it's your own cells, exploits that same mechanism to avoid immune detection, and it, it basically is able to grow unhindered. And uh, checkpoint inhibitors are a class of drugs that uh, block that recognition pathway, causing the cancer cells to appear foreign to the immune cells, and uh, allowing an immune response to uh, basically allow your immune system to uh, clear up your disease. So what we do is we take, we work with clinical and biological collaborators to try to identify the key biophysical processes involved in this and see if we can describe it mathematically in a way that would allow us to both calculate what may happen to a patient in a predictive sort of manner and uh, in the case that uh, therapy doesn't work, we want to maybe try to identify what's going on inside that patient, what point of failure within the system is happening. And if we could identify that, there are other drugs and uh, therapeutic approaches that you can give to a patient to maybe kick that uh, point of failure into gear and maybe shift the patient from a position of uh, drug failure to drug or treatment success. And so in the particular model I'm going to show you, uh, this is an overarching uh, diagram of uh, what we put in. Basically, uh, you have the drug, which is delivered, uh, it's an antibody, and it's delivered via the blood, and it diffuses uh, uh, through the endothelial lining of the vasculature and into the tumor. And depending on the uh, checkpoint inhibitor drug you give, it binds in uh, different places, and it uh, basically causes this immune cell recognition. Also, immune cells are recruited to the tumor via several uh, chemical signaling uh, pathways, including uh, cytokines and other chemokines that uh, recruit them. And so uh, you can describe this all mathematically and crunch some numbers, and you can come up with some general equations that I've shown over here. And you can apply some more equations and reduce this down to one single equation. And uh, I'm going to try to hit on as to uh, why that's so important. Um, as we go forward. Um, so basically to eliminate this large series of math, which I haven't shown all of it, and to come uh, down to the single equation, we have to make some reasonable assumptions, really to eliminate things we can't uh, measure. You can't know where an immune cell is inside a patient. You, you can't uh, see a diffusion rates, things like that. And so we basically just uh, take a time dependent average and uh, assume that uh, that's what's going on. And we come up with this that I'm gonna call this master equation that basically describes the tumor volume over time as a function of these so-called, uh, I'm gonna call say super parameters, which is a made up mathematical term, but basically it just means that each variable uh, contains a uh, some other information inside of it. Um, and uh, these are the two, uh, two of the three I'm going to show. Uh, they're built on uh, biophysical processes such as, uh, you know, drug binding and kill rates, uh, immune cell counts, uh, tumor cell counts, uh, the fitness of the immune cells, uh, because uh, immune cells uh, start off healthier, but they age just like we do and they become less efficient, things like that. 
And uh, when we take this uh, long or this uh, master equation, we can basically integrate. And depending upon the uh, uh, limits of integration we apply, we can come up with a so-called long-term solution, which projects, uh, suppose the patient uh, lived forever, what would happen uh, long-term mathematically? And we can project short-term and uh, transient solutions as well. And uh, so what we did is to start with this, um, we, we wanted to find predictive quantities. And so the first thing we have to do is show that they are in fact distinct between a responding, which is what I'm gonna call a cancer patient who sees a, a, their tumor shrink after treatment and a non-responding patient who uh, continued to see disease progression. And we start there because if there's no distinction between uh, these parameters and these two sets, then you don't really have anything that can predict anything. So what we did is we obtained a measured uh, data via CT from patients. And um, we basically uh, used Mathematica to uh, do a nonlinear regression of the uh, time dependent form of this equation to the data. And uh, to determine uh, what sort of parameter values we were looking for and uh, what associated to responders, non-responders, that sort of thing. And uh, to uh, fill you in on some of the medical terminology, uh, basically whenever a patient is seen by a doctor, they put them in a CT scan and they scan them and measure their tumors. And this is called restaging in the clinic. And uh, so these patients or any patient has, after diagnosis, they get an original uh, Re, a state, it's called a restaging, but really it's the first staging where they look at them and see where they start. Then they uh, restage when they start delivering drugs. And then the patient is uh, remeasured uh, going forward. And uh, what we found is that we could actually use one of the parameters in this uh, model I just showed you to estimate the uh, tumor growth rate. And uh, it's simple, but it's actually an improvement over what they're doing now, which is just measuring based on uh, the total size change. Uh, and basically the reason it's an improvement is because it allows us to move the time where we can make a prediction earlier, uh, which you might imagine uh, if uh, you have stage four cancer, uh, you need uh, information early so that if your treatment's not working, uh, we can tell you uh, before it's too late. So we uh, collected some uh, patient data from uh, our collaborators at MD Anderson Cancer Center. Uh, and uh, we collected uh, three patient cohorts uh, that I kind of describe here, two from the hospital, and then a third we collected from these four uh, papers in the literature. Uh, I'll skim over this. This is just to show our cohort, uh, so-called basket cohort was basically anything we could get because this patient, this data is very hard to come by. So we uh, looked at uh, the, what we predicted with our uh, model in terms of uh, long-term uh, patient tumor burden. We compare it to uh, measured tumor burden and we see a pretty good correlation. And uh, you can see in these uh, large uh, long time points uh, we start to move off of this a uh, one-to-one -one correlation. And really this is because mathematically we're projecting time to quote infinity. But in reality, on, on the x-axis, I'm comparing to the last measured time, which of course is not infinity. So uh, in these patients where the tumor is growing, you would expect at infinity, it would have grown even more than the last measured time. And you see that up here. And Likewise, if it was shrinking, it would have shrunk even more to infinity. And so uh, that explains uh, this deviation down here. We also looked at um, the tumor growth rates. And what we found is that by the first uh, patient follow-up, they really coordinated well between uh, our first uh, model-derived uh, growth rate and a long-term growth rate. And this was actually really powerful because it allowed us to predict long-term using a piece of data that we were able to get within about six weeks of uh, the patient starting treatments. And uh, I'll just uh, briefly show um, another thing we did is uh, we wanted to see, could we uh, correlate these to uh, biological measurements? And so we were able to collect some uh, needle biopsy uh, samples from patients, and we were able to count the biological uh, factors represented in some of these model parameters as best we could. You can't measure all of them, but we were able to measure the ones that you can measure. 
And when we uh, compared them to uh, what we had uh, determined mathematically, we actually turned uh, this literature is uh, uh, measured about uh, values from real biology that we pulled out of uh, literature papers. And this is what our model predicted. And so we found that we were actually doing a pretty good job of calculating uh, just from CT images, some of these uh, cell level things that we can't measure like uh, immune cells within the tumor. And uh, this one is uh, PDL1 is one of the molecules that the drug uh, targets. And so obviously it needs to be there for the drug to work. So uh, that was important. Uh, moving forward here, we, uh, what we observed was that uh, the uh, model parameters that I showed were distinct between uh, responding and non-responding patients in this retroactive, uh, this first study was retrospective. And so that's great because that means we can use it to uh, make predictions moving forward. And uh, what was interesting is we could actually do it by, this is median of 53 days after the treatment started, which... Uh, to our knowledge is the earliest uh, time people have been able to predict whether this sort of treatment is gonna succeed or fail. And uh, so then we got this other cohort and we did this uh, predictively and we found out that it still worked pretty well. Because this cohort is a mixture of all different cancer types, uh, some of the data isn't quite as good as uh, you can see here. But we were surprised that even by just basically throwing the worst case scenario in, uh, we were still able to make some distinct predictions, uh, as you can see with the, in here and with our uh, rock curves here. And uh, I, I'll just uh, continue on just to show it did work in other uh, sets. But uh, we were uh, later able to uh, come back and we were actually able to uh, study uh, long term of what happened to these patients a long time later. What I'm showing here is a survival. And uh, it turns out that we were able to uh, predict uh, patients who would survive. And basically, uh, this is a split to uh, median survival time. So uh, all of this, the patients in this uh, set were stage four when they came into the study and basically everything else they had tried had already failed for them. So uh, they were in pretty bad shape. But uh, we were able to determine uh, pretty well, and which is shown by uh, the, the separation between the, the curves and these Kaplan-Meier plots, um, that uh, we were able to use this uh, growth rate parameter to predict uh, patients uh, who uh, were going to do well and who would not. And this is actually a really powerful thing here. And uh, I'm, I'm going to digress a minute on it just to make the point. Um, that we're able to do this using a single number. And uh, I'll tell the story of my experience with this. The first time we realized we were able to predict which patients were gonna respond to treatment and which weren't, I told an MD PhD I work with, we could do this with this differential equation. And he said, that's great, too bad I'll never use it. And uh, I was a little surprised by that. And he explained to me that he had about five seconds to make a decision on a patient and to process everything they had. And if it was more complicated than something that he could count on the fingers of one hand, neither he nor anybody in the clinic would ever use it, which uh, was a painful, a painful lesson because it sent us back to the drawing board to bang our heads against this for a long time. How can we take this complicated mathematical problem that uh, really is beyond what a doctor is even going to look at and boil it down to a single number such that uh, they might actually use it to make a decision. And uh, that's what we're able to do here. And uh, I just uh, belabor the point uh, because that's something I didn't understand. Um, but thinking back, you know, doctors, they make decisions based on your body temperature or your body weight or scalars. And um, so uh, it was really painful to do this on our end, it took a long time to uh, come to this uh, particular figure, but uh, I just belabor the point to uh, kind of uh, make the point that uh, if you want to get into that field and try to make something that might actually be usable, we have to go the opposite direction that us math people want to go. See, we want to put every possible thing in every possible equation, and we had to go backwards to kind of bridge the gap between the mathematical and the medical languages in order to get something they were now interested in. And this has gotten a lot of attention. Uh, we've actually uh, written this particular result into a clinical trial proposal, and we're hoping to actually 
not make decisions with patients with it, but to actually use it in a clinical trial uh, alongside the standard procedure to see if it works there. So uh, to my knowledge, that hasn't been done yet with the mathematical model. And so this is really, really exciting stuff. I'll uh, change direction a little bit and talk about a, another problem of particular or clinical in interest in my last few minutes. Um, there's a phenomenon called pseudoprogression in immunotherapy, where sometimes you give a patient an immu immunotherapy, and the next time you look at their tumors, they've just exploded. They've just gotten much, much larger than they were before. And sometimes they just keep growing, and it's bad. And sometimes they shrink uh, with a very strong drug response after that, and it's great. But doctors don't know who is who. And so whenever they give you this treatment and your tumors get a lot bigger, the only thing they can do is wait. And that's bad because if you're not going to respond, uh, that's bad. You may have lost two of your last six months to live and maybe your last chance to try something else. And so they keep asking us, can you identify these pseudoprogressors? And we, uh, we pulled the pseudoprogressors out of uh, our data set that we had, and this is what they looked like. This is just the normalized tumor uh, over time. And you can see they all have a fast increase followed by, in some cases, a very, very strong response. And so we wanted to see, could our model at least in principle distinguish these? And it's difficult to show, and I haven't done a very good job here, but uh, we have found uh, something that is distinct and that basically we're able to mechanistically can't capture a ramping up of this kill uh, effect. And when we take the different uh, limits of integration on our model and we solve for the long term to infinity versus a short term solution, in the, uh, the patients that respond, there's always fairly strong uh, tumor killing. In the patients that don't, there's always fairly weak. But in the patients that have the pseudo response, what you get is you get a small value in the short-term solution and you get a larger value in the long-term solution. And we're seeing this ramp up effect. And so we're still working out the details as to how we can predict this by that first time point. But uh, we're all pretty excited about it because if we can hammer that out, we'll have uh, solved or at least theoretically been able to identify one way to solve this major problem in current practice. And uh, I'll, I'll just touch on a couple other things we've done. We also started to study what I'm going to call the strength of immune response uh, versus uh, drug type and versus tumor type. And what we found is that there is unique sort of uh, cutoffs of immune response between uh, cancer and drug types. And so we're trying to kind of uh, take this to a place where um, instead of just giving one value, kind of like, you know, your body temperature, it's like, oh, you're over 98.6, well, maybe you're sick. And oh, you're around uh, this temperature, well, maybe you're not. Well, we'd like to further discretize this problem into something where uh, we can take a certain cancer, say, okay, you're going to treat this certain cancer with a certain kind of drug. We can calculate some things and we can predict, are you going to respond or are you not going to respond? And uh, maybe make some suggestions about how you might change the treatment or to pick a different treatment uh, such that you might have a better chance, uh, especially if this is kind of your last hurrah in that uh, department. So, I'll make a point, uh, this, is, um, this model is fairly unique in the field in that we don't rely on anything that we are dependent on somebody discovering a way to measure. We only use data that we were able to get that the clinicians had already measured, or there are things we can change, like drug rate or uh, drug dosage, dosage schedule, things like that. Um, and so uh, we hope that uh, we uh, will get that uh, funding for this uh, clinical trial and uh, we'll be able to uh, take this uh, into uh, an actual predictive uh, situation where uh, maybe we can actually make an impact for some patients. Uh, we're also looking at some other things right now where we're looking at ways we can measure these things uh, from the blood. And uh, I'll just say I'm looking at some uh, more uh, complicated measuring modalities now. Uh, 
we're working uh, with someone who does uh, brain cancer glioblastoma uh, imaging. And uh, there's some pretty exciting things that are happening in brain cancer imaging where they're doing things like, for example, one's called dynamic tensor imaging, where they can actually take a series of uh, snapshots and they can actually calculate directional flow rate within uh, parts of the brain uh, tissues. And so you can actually image things like the rate of drug delivery or even the rate of uh, immune influx into the tumor. And so we're trying to figure out, are there ways that we can actually non-invasively measure some of these actual parameters and uh, possibly even move to where we might be able to tell you the day you start treatment isn't going to work or not. Um, so uh, I'll just briefly thank, uh, this involved a whole lot of uh, people, uh, all of who uh, have uh, greater titles and uh, importance and power than I do. So I really just wanna thank each and every one of them uh, for their uh, help in this uh, massive undertaking. And uh, I will uh, now uh, come into, um, I will now come into uh, our uh, pathable window here and uh, look at uh, some of uh, our questions. So uh, James asks, uh, it appears you built a single model for various cancer types. What is your explanation for the fact that one single mathematical model can work well across different cancer types? Oh yes, that is a, uh, that is a common uh, question. And uh, the answer is it doesn't work for all cancer types. Um, it's a uh, solid tumors. Uh, so it's, uh, I, I neglected to mention, of course, this won't work for, uh, I'd say blood cancers, uh, things like uh, uh, lymphomas or uh, things like that. But um, we basically tried to capture only the processes that are universal to this uh, drug treatment. So for example, one immunotherapy drug must go into all tumors and the immune cells must go into the tumors for it to work. And so this isn't dependent on say a particular molecule or a particular pathway that's uh, unique to a certain cancer. Like with uh, breast cancer, you might target like the estrogen pathway or, or something like that with, uh, I think tamoxifen uh, is a, a common treatment that uh, attacks uh, that particular mechanism. And so, um, so it's worked in every cancer we've tried it in so far, uh, but uh, I can't say it will work in everything, but uh, fingers crossed. And uh, Mr. Dimitrov asks, uh, has it been investigated why some people respond to immunotherapy and others don't? And so can you use your model to understand further? Well, um, they are trying to understand that. And uh, the reality is we, we have some ideas and we don't always know. I mentioned that for this particular kind of immunotherapy, it's a checkpoint inhibitor. And so obviously that molecular checkpoint has to be expressed in that tumor. And so for some cancers, they will actually take needle biopsies and they will uh, do uh, immune histochemical analysis and they'll look to confirm the presence of that uh, marker. Um, and uh, that uh, is an indicator that you're more likely to work, but uh, it doesn't guarantee it. So, so that's one of the things we're trying to hash out is, is there a particular marker that causes it not to work or is it more a uh, safe physical uh, mechanism? And uh, we're, um, we're still trying to uh, address that, but that is a major uh, unknown uh, across the clinical practice now. Okay, so uh, Vincent says the fact that patient survival is correlated with tumor growth rate is reminiscent of the tumor growth inhibition approach developed by Laurent Claret and uh, Rene Ren Bruno. Any comments on this? Okay, so um, I assume this refers to uh, the ongoing debate between uh, tumor uh, elimination and uh, tumor uh, ma maintenance. So uh, the field is uh, kind of uh, shifting in terms of thinking. For, for many years, the idea was that uh, we must eliminate a patient's cancer. We have to kill all of it and we have to achieve a pure 100% cure. 
And what they're seeing with immunotherapy is that's not always the case. There have been, I have colleagues who've seen patients receive immunotherapy and have their tumors just say the same size for over a decade. It's rare, but uh, you're basically in a small subset of patients actually able to extend their life almost to where they would have lived had they not developed cancer by not eliminating the cancer, but by actually maintaining it. And um, this, is, uh, this is an interesting uh, source of, um, of uh, study right now. And uh, Vincent, uh, you are onto something because if you... Uh, Look, and I'll, I'll upload my talk uh, or my uh, slides to uh, Pathable after this, but if you look at the Kaplan-Meier curves I showed of survival, the uh, growth rate was not zero. That's determined like a bad survival versus good survival. And we thought it would be zero because a zero growth rate means like, you know, positive growth rate, you're growing and negative growth rate, you're shrinking, right? But what we found was that wasn't the case. We found that some patients who their tumor still grew but they just grew very slowly, were actually in the good survival group and survived much longer than the majority of their peers on the study. And so we actually saw some of this uh, supported in our data where we saw the idea that, uh, that cure wasn't necessarily uh, necessary for them to end up in this favorable group. So, um, so yeah, our, our approach does uh, support that. And uh, hopefully uh, we can, uh, I don't know, we've, we've been able to put a number on that growth rate now that's worked well. And uh, we tried that in three different cohorts and it worked well in all three of them. So uh, we hope that it works in more and uh, we're trying to get that data now. Okay, let's see. Andy asks about, uh, were there any tracing patients on trials with neuroendocrine carcinomas? Um, no, we uh, didn't get that. Uh, I'll, I'll just say that uh, this data is uh, very, very difficult to get. And I am very fortunate to have collaborators who are actually able to share it or willing to share it with me. Um, and so basically we took everything that we could get. And um, yeah, the, this data is, uh, well, I, I, I don't know. I'll, I'll just say that I think the data that I showed in that cohort of 93 patients. I think the drug alone in the cl cl uh, clinical trial was, uh, I think it was 60,000 US a dose and they got four doses. So you can do the math at $240,000 of drug times 93 patients and uh, figure out what that data actually costs. So, um, so yeah, that um, just as for one reason, uh, and uh, some of these people, uh, are apprehensive to share it. So I really want to just thank those clinical collaborators that I showed um, uh, for uh, sharing that. Uh, and uh, one last question, Ahmed uh, here asks uh, if there's a place where we can look at the details. Yes, uh, I'll upload uh, a paper that uh, will point you to the derivation of this model. We've published it and we've made them open source. So you should be able to get it. But uh, I will share one with you guys uh, in the files uh, when we're done here. But uh, anyways, it looks like we're out of time. And uh, so thank you all so much for joining me. It's uh, been a pleasure.